This is my desire to love you all my days, to know you as the potter, and to trust you like the clay.
breaking us down to build us back up again in your image. Because when I build my own kingdom in my own image, it only lasts as long as the weather permits. So, yeah. Think about that. Oh, you build us, you build us, you build us up. Your own image, Lord, in the image of the Father. When we get off track for a little bit and we start to build things that we don't commit to, oh, the Father comes. He says, I'm making all things new. All things new. I'm making all. Oh, prophesy that over your house right now personal household, your own house, you're making all things, my son that left my house, my daughter that ran away, the broken relationships, even if, even if, even if you don't understand, see, we're more free than we realize, we're more free, God gives us the freedom to declare and prophesy things that haven't come about yet, so even if your feelings don't feel like they're permitting you to say something that's true, you got to just push that aside and say, Lord, you've said, you said that you're making all things new. So I prophesy over my own household, over the relationships that are most important to me, God. I say you're making all things new, all things new, all things new.
fortress God, you mighty fortress God. When what you build stands the test of time, we're not worried about empty church buildings with for sale signs. Church is alive. The church is alive. The church is alive in this region. The church is alive. Who is this coming up over the hills, leaning on the arms of? It's always been a love affair, right? It's always been a love affair that brought us into the church. I mean, we got cool stuff, right? We got a lot of cool stuff, but it was never the cool stuff that kept us there. It was always the love affair. So we just say, Lord, pour out your love on this place because we need your love more than we need cool stuff. We need your love more than we need the right programs and the right, we just need your love in this place, God, in this city, in this region. Like a mighty fortress, he's our God. Like a mighty fortress, he's our God.
released in that place when you know when there's a revelation that the father of heaven the father of your heart is singing over you because he's not phased he's not moved he's not afraid of your situation he's not moved by your situation he stays the same he is faithful he is faithful and he does not waver no matter what comes at him, no matter what comes at you, he is unafraid and unshaken. So let's sing this out again. He rejoices, he rejoices over us, over me, over you. Let's just sing this out together. And let's just keep singing this out. Let's just keep singing it out with one voice. Every 
were simple and easy and I already got that. May it be new every time. You're singing over me. You're singing over me. And you'll never, ever, ever stop.
Father's singing this over us right now. This love is patient. This love is kind. This love sees everything when others are blind. It won't make you jealous, but it'll leave you a mess. This love is absent. Here all the time. Let's sing that again. This love is patient. This love is kind. And this love sees everything when others are blind. It won't make you jealous, but it'll leave you a mess. This love is absent. Here all the time. Our first 10-minute speaker is Sammy Grooms. You guys give her a hand. <laughs> Sammy, how old are you? All right, Sammy is 19. That's brave. That's good. Go for it. Thank you. Good morning. A couple of months ago, the Lord started teaching me on the book of Hosea, and he was giving me a new revelation on it. And right when he started, he was like, you're going to have to teach on that. And I was like, uh -huh, we'll see. And so, here I am now, really honored to share it with you all. Thank you, Pastor. Hosea chapter 1, verse 2 says, When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute, so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. This story doesn't only apply to Israel and to Hosea and Gomer. It applies to America and to Christianity today. Chapter 2, verse 5 says, Their mother is a shameless prostitute and became pregnant in a shameful way. She said, I'll run after other lovers and sell myself to them for food and water, for clothing of wool and linen, and for olive oil and drinks. Now, Gomer became physically pregnant in a shameful way by committing adultery on her husband during prostitution. In the same way, we become spiritually pregnant in shameful ways all the time by committing adultery on the Lord and having prostitution with the world. And how is it that we do that? It's by yielding to the seduction and enticement of Satan. And what is it that he tries to entrap us with since the day of our conception? Sin. Anything unholy and unscriptural. Anything that ultimately covers us in filth and shame and separation from God. Satan does anything to get us distracted from and ignoring and not believing in Jesus. He pushes and pushes and pushes at every raw and weak area in us until we yield to his conspiracy of wickedness. He causes us to stumble here by one act of manipulation. And then he covers it up with some more lies over there. 
and he wraps it all in this big ungodly fantasy. And the sinful urges within us crave it, so we embrace the sin, and we cover it with excuses, and we cover it with arrogance, and we act like God doesn't see it, or that God won't care, or that God won't deal with it. We lay in bed with compromise, and we cover up with a lukewarm blanket of unholiness. And just because America and Christianity are different today, and sin is modernized, it does not mean that spiritual adultery is not happening anymore. And it does not mean that every sinful action that we choose to take is covered in grace and should be ignored. The unrepentant sin that we choose to stay in will have consequences no less severe than the people in the Bible. When we say with our words, but more commonly with our actions, that we're going to run after other lovers, yes, obviously they look different. We're not burning incenses on an altar, and we're not on our knees before idols, but there are a ton of modern idols, you know? For example, we are literally consumed and dependent on electronics, and we have an impatient and selfish desire for instant gratification for our flesh. And we have life, and we have plans that keep us too busy for God. And we have an unhealthy relationship and obsession with money. That does nothing but rob our time and our peace and our focus from the Lord. And solely trusting in Jesus and staying faithful to him is the last thing on our list. We'd rather sell our souls and gain this world and his perishing offers of disgust than just stay faithful to him. We run to it for satisfaction and we trust in it for the outcomes of our situations. These are just a few examples of putting idols before God and committing spiritual adultery. Chapter 2, verse 13 says, I will punish her for all of those times when she burned incense to her images of Baal, when she put on her earrings and jewels and went out to look for her lovers, but forgot all about me, says the Lord. How about those times when we dress up to go out with that guy or that girl without actually asking God if they're the one he created for us? because we don't want to risk hearing him say no. How about those times that we forget about church, but we spend hours watching that sports game, but no time on our knees? And I don't mean time on your knees in front of your TV, screaming at it because your player dropped the ball. How about being consumed with TVs and movies created by blatantly demonic companies? and indulging in books and websites that do nothing but destroy our perspectives to what sin actually looks like. And it desensitizes us to what it really is. And it distorts our image of what true love looks like and what respect and what honor and humility really are. And these are beautiful characteristics and gifts that God gives to us, and they're completely lacking. When God's cry is for us to consecrate ourselves and set ourselves apart with him so we can delve into the depths of his heart and his personality and learn his character. That's amazing. But instead, we forget about him and we put idols before him and this will reap consequence. Verse 7 says, When she runs after her lovers, she won't be able to catch them. She will search for them, but not find them. He is a jealous God, and he's really amazing. He doesn't tolerate our idols. In fact, when we put something in front of him in his place, he shatters it in one way or another. For example, we have money or materials where Jesus is supposed to be, and all of a sudden they end up gone. Or we have a person or a relationship in the place where Jesus is supposed to be, and all of a sudden issues arise in that relationship. Or there's opportunities or circumstances that look really good, so we want to blow God off because we want to do our own thing and do it anyway, even when it's not part of his plan. And then they stall out and they cease. That's why when we try to run after other lovers for satisfaction, we don't find anything that lasts temporarily or even at all. Because nothing can quench the longings in our souls for intimacy and satisfaction like Jesus. He's meant to be our first love. And sadly, it's after that we search for love and significance and meaning and satisfaction and things other than him, we become more and more empty. 
and circumstances beyond our control keep happening that just break us, and we become exasperated and hopeless, but Jesus is still our last resort. A continuation of verse 7 says, Then she will think, I might as well return to my husband, for I was better off with him than I am now. In some cases, only when it's convenient do we actually return to Jesus. But that's only until he isn't good enough again. So we try to run or to shut him out and blow him off to satisfy our flesh. We shatter our side of the relationship time and time again, but he never does. He knows how vain we are. But his heart is just grieved because he knows every second of our destiny that we are missing out on when we choose not to pursue him. All he wants to do is give us all that he has, asking only that we give him all that we are. Verse 8 says, She doesn't realize that it's I who gave her everything that she has, the grain, the new wine, the olive oil. I even gave her silver and gold but she gave my gifts to Baal. We honestly forget that every good and perfect gift we have really comes from God. The clothes we have, the electronics we have, and a home to live in, but we dress in provocative ways, and we use electronics to sin, and we keep the doors to our houses open to demons, and we let them dwell with us. God gives us breath, and he gives us life, but we give our gifts to the world. Chapter 2, verse 13 says, I will punish her for all of those times when she burned incense to her images of Baal, when she put on her earrings and jewels and went out to look for her lovers, but forgot all about me, says the Lord. When we choose to forget the Lord and to run from him, we are being sinful and deserving of punishment. But it's when we choose to acknowledge our wicked ways and then turn from them, our eyes can then be open to the redemption in our daddy's heart, and it is an amazing thing. In the scripture, after he says that he will punish her for her wicked ways and for looking for other lovers and forgetting about him, he says in verse 14, but then I will win her back once again. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her there. How many of you here have ever felt stuck in a desert? where you feel dry and weary and like there's no purpose and there's no hope. I want to tell you today that a desert is not always a bad place. The scripture says that he will lead her there and he will speak tenderly to her there. And the desert is that place where we feel weak and we feel weary and like we can't take another step. But it's that moment that we realize that we can't do life without Jesus. It is not possible. And we just want to give up and we just want to run that he wraps his arms around us, and he says, don't worry, my child. I have a beautiful and glorious destiny just for you. Regardless of your past and everything that's happened in it and how dirty you feel and how full of shame you feel, I have so many things to show you and to teach you. Abide in me, and the kingdom of heaven will be released, and nothing can touch you. My child, I have overcome the world there's no need to compromise and to settle, trying to fill the voids in your heart. And there's no need to rush ahead of me, trying to make things happen without me either. Verses 15 and 16 say, I will return her vineyards to her and transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. She would give herself to me there as she did long ago when she was young, when I freed her from her captivity in Egypt. When that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of my master. So it is after being led to the desert by the Lord, and he speaks tenderly to every area where we feel broken and we feel weary and we feel hopeless, that we get redeemed and we get healed and everything that was stolen from us has to be returned because that's what God does. And our hopelessness and despair are transformed into this incomprehensible amount of hope and a joyous expectation for life. He happily frees us from our captivity when we're actually willing to just let him do it. And he says that we will call him our husband instead of our master because his longing is for us to know and to embrace our identities as his bride, not to just view him as some inconvenient master who controls us and judges us and condemns us and treats us like puppets. 
He says in verses 19 and 20, I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine, and you will finally know me as the Lord. The Lord who literally lived perfection says that he will be faithful to us and he will make us his. How incredible is that? In chapter 3, verse 1 says, And then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. And that's exactly what Hosea did. Every time Gomer ran to go commit prostitution, he spared no expense to faithfully pursue her heart and to redeem her. And even though we constantly buck against God and we fill his place with other things, he is in relentless pursuit of our hearts. So I want to encourage you today to let Jesus lead you to the desert. Get to the place where you feel weak and where you feel vulnerable and where you feel broken. And let him heal you and let him restore you and empower you. Because it's from that intimacy that you have with Jesus, you will have the strength to be able to stay faithful to him and to rise up from that dark place of spiritual adultery against him. And you're never too far gone, and you're never too far broken or dirty or sinful. No matter what Satan tries to tell you repeatedly, you're not. Because God's perfect love always redeems. <laughs> That's awesome. I hope you caught all that. That was a whole lot to chew on. Let me. Hey, hey, here's Deborah. All right, we've got a second ten-minute speaker, so she's gonna be less than ten minutes. She said. So here we go. All right, that was awesome. I felt like she was um, speaking my message. The intercession was so good. I don't want to take too long because I want us to get back to the intercession. I really feel like that's the heart of God for us today. Um, you know, the Moravian intercession, I just, I really felt that. You know, I felt the Lord saying to me this morning, you know, I prepared a bunch of stuff like I always do. But I felt like the Lord saying to me, watchman on the wall, what do you see? And he kept saying that to me this morning. And so I got here, and during worship, and the intercession that was flowing I, I could hear the Lord, and he was saying to me, Watchman on the wall, what do you see? And I said, well, Lord, I'm looking, I'm looking in here, and I'm seeing intercession. I'm seeing a group of people who have hope, who come together every week with hope that you're going to show up, that you're going to be pleased with the worship that goes forth, that you're going to mend our hearts and do things in our midst, and that we're going to be able to have something to say that changes the nations, that changes our families, that changes our lives. This is what I see. And he said, all right, watchman on the wall, what else do you see? And I said, well, I see a bunch of people who've been through a really hard season, a really hard season. It's been a desert. It's been a wilderness, just like she said. But those people are coming out of the wilderness. You know, Job was tested, and so was Peter, but they both came out on the other side. Peter denied the Lord, but he was restored. So it really doesn't matter. We have been through some things because Babylon has been hanging on us. And God has been getting rid of Babylon in us. And we're so grateful now that it's happening to us. We're like, yes, I had no idea that I was so gunked up. I had no idea that I needed to be freed from that. So Babylon is falling off of us. And so these people that are coming in from the wilderness who have the glory of the Lord on them, rise and shine for the glory of the Lord has come upon you. There is deep darkness in the earth. So watchman on the wall, what do you see? Well, when I look out, I see the barbarians at the gates. I see them gnashing their teeth to get at us. I see the tares among us. I see things, Lord, that are, that are working to tear us down, the accuser of the brethren. I see things that are happening in the earth that are terrifying. I see people in other nations right now, brothers and sisters in Christ, who don't know anything about prosperity gospel. They don't know anything about any of that stuff. All they know is they are going through hell right now. I see things, Lord, that need to be fixed. I see where justice needs to reign. So, watchman on the wall, what do you see? Well, 
I look around, and during worship today, I saw angels. I don't see angels. It was just in my spirit, in my mind's eye. I've never seen one. But in my mind's eye, I saw angels. And they were all around, and they were so attentive. And I saw one that was really stout. And a tear was running down his eye. And I saw other ones who were bowed down on one knee, keeping watch, but worshiping. And they are, they, they're looking at a place like this, and they're saying, here's some people who's, I, I see the fragrance coming up from their lives. I see the incense. I see, this is a holy place. When we come together in that kind of worship, this is a holy place. The Lord says, nothing's going to break in on this holy place. This is, this is my chamber. And you're with me here in this chamber, and this is holy. This is between you and I. And what we do here is holy. And this transaction that happens here is holy. It means something. And the angels see it, they recognize it, and they're ready. They are so ready. And so I feel like today, as we go back into worship, that that's what the Lord was saying. Watchmen on the wall to all of us. What do you see? Because there's a holy transaction that has happened here. And just like Esther, who went before the king and had favor in his sight, and he put his scepter out to her, and he said, what do you want, Esther? And she was able to get what she wanted. And the Lord is saying to us, they, they gnash their teeth at you, but they will never break in. I am going to do something in this earth that, listen, they've got plans. The barbarians at the gates have plans. They definitely have plans. Too bad. Our God is greater. May they fall into their own pit. And I'm going to read this and I'm done. Lord, this is Psalms 94, 19 through 23. Lord, when doubts fill my mind, when my heart is in turmoil, quiet me and give me renewed hope and cheer. Will you permit a corrupt government to rule under your protection, a government permitting wrong to defeat right? Do you approve of those who condemn the innocent to death? No. The Lord my God is my fortress and the mighty rock where I can hide. God has made the sins of evil men to boomerang upon them. He will destroy them by their own plans. Jehovah our God will cut them off. And we are just the people in the secret place, in the chambers of the Lord, who are going to intercede for such a thing. We come here week after week with hope and with faith, and it will not disappoint. Amen? Amen. Hey, we're going to go ahead. I'm, you could, hey, take a deep breath. Say, I'm not going to preach. I just want you to do something with me. I want you to participate. There's something going on. And when I see these kind of things, I want to jump in on it. So I'm going to ask you to help. Today, all across America, churches are, are gathering to spend five minutes on their face before God. And I was looking last night and... Um, North Carolina is actually number two in the nation, churches that committed to do that. Uh, California was number one, and then uh, us, and then Texas. And uh, then I saw, you know, many others. The only state was Nevada, and I don't understand that, but we'll just, we'll intercede with them and for them. But, uh, but let me explain what, I, what, uh, what we want to do. But what they wanted, they're calling us to spend five minutes on our face before God. It's a very strategic time in our nation. How many of you know that? There are a lot of calls right now to prayer and intercession. How many of you saw Cindy Jacobs' word that just was sent out? And uh, Cindy said, the enemy's not only at the gate, but basically he's come through the gates. And we see that in the natural, and, uh, but we know that is a true word. And we're to intercede, lock arms, and she's calling the warriors, the intercessors to prayer. And then how many of you saw Ann Graham Lott's the word, we, we tried to send that out. I have a lot of respect, a bunch of respect for the Graham family. And uh, they've not finished with what they've been called to do on the earth, that entire family. But 
I really, she was calling. In fact, she shares how her husband has gotten ill, and so she spent a lot of time at home and thus a lot of time with the Lord. And she saw that we're at the end of all things, and so there's a trumpet sound that she was to sound the alarm to pray, and she mentioned three things. And I, all this is to prepare us for what we're going to do in a moment. But she said, number one, pray for God to restrain, protect, and deliver its, his people from evil that is come into the world. And then secondly, for God to be exalted, glorified in his church and in our nation. And for God the Holy Spirit to fall afresh, compelling the church to repent of sin and our nation to return to the living God, resulting in another great awakening. Now, we've been praying stuff like that. We've been acting prophetically and doing things. We're believing these grounds are set apart to host the great awakening. And I believe that. And I believe that all the way to the grave because I believe America, it's going to happen all over, South Florida and many other places. And um, so anyway, we want to be a part. Now, and also ask people to pray from July the 1st to July the 7th, the fast on the 7th, and then... Um, on that day, you know, that's the big crescendo. But, man, there are many people, many, many things are happening to call America to prayer. It's not by accident. We don't want to take it lightly. We want to jump in and be a part. Now, let me share this. This is what I was thinking. I wrote this down last night. God's highest purpose is not to see America return to its former greatness, but its church, its people walk in a greater glory. That's the, the end result of what God wants. Now, yes, we want to pray for protection this morning. So when I ask you to hit your knees or your face, I hope everybody will participate. There could be a million Christians today on their face crying out to God. Wouldn't that be incredible? Maybe two million. I saw one uh, estimation. And, uh, but, yes, we want to pray. Pray for a great awakening. Pray we talked about last night, remember, or last week, those three things in Acts. You know, number one, pray for boldness, that we could speak the word of God as we ought. And God would open doors. And he's been doing that. Last Sunday, I was blown away by just, I was just by his presence and the anointing. And this, today I was. And then secondly, to pray that God would stretch forth his hand to heal, that signs and wonders would be done through the holy name of his servant, Jesus. Some of you need a sign and a wonder today. And so we want to pray for that. Yes, that's part of it. But then also remember the third part, the place where they were assembled was shaken. So we want to pray that God would shake every house of God in America, whether they're asking for it or not, that he'd just show up in the houses of God. That would be incredible. And yes, we want to pray for his manifest presence and all these things. But here's what I want to ask us to do, because before God can do any of that, something has to happen. What do you think it is? A lot of what uh, Sammy was talking about. God's raising up 19-year-olds that are going to blaze like John the Baptist. And 35-year-olds, Deborah. <laughs> you know what I mean. But anyway, Job chapter 12. Now, this is direction, okay? So, and then we're going to, we got to spend five minutes. I want to be a part of this. I mean, are you guys okay if I involve you in this? We're a part of multitudes of believers today all across America. We're the only church in Wilkes County. Now, I'm not, that doesn't boast. I just, we're the only one, I guess, that found out about it. That's all I know. It doesn't matter to me. But we can put a whole bunch to flight. What? Yeah, do what? We'll carry them. Yeah, that's not a boast. I'm just saying it doesn't take a lot. It just takes those that are willing. A few. Ann always reminds me of that. When we don't have an overflowing crowd at prayer, she says it just takes a few to bombard heaven, and we've been doing it for two and a half years. But anyway, in Job chapter 12, listen to this. This is the direction. I don't think the problem is Barack Obama. I don't think the problem is ISIS. I don't think the problem is Putin. I don't think, let me show you what I think the problem is. Anyway, Job chapter 12. Now, remember, I got to put this in there. Job, next, the next chapter, he already discovers, he says, though you slay me, Yet I will trust you. Remember that? He had to learn that. Well, what was he talking about? He was slayed. That's what happened. Now, let me, he, but he learned to trust him. Let me tell you something else real quick. God is looking for a people that will endure to the end. 
Even if he takes his hand off of them for a brief moment, they will love him regardless of what happens. And he's going to have a testimony, just like he had in Job. Satan understood that God's servant Job would not turn his back on God. And, it, and that's what happened. In the end, we saw what God had in mind and how he restored. But anyway, Job 12, 13, but only with God. He is perfect and wisdom and might. I'm reading out of the Amplified. He alone has counsel and understanding. Behold, he tears down and it cannot be built again. He shuts a man in and no one can open it up. He withholds the waters and the land dries up. He sends forth the rain and they're overwhelmed the land. With him are might and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are in his power. He leads and strips away the barefoot and makes the judges fools in human estimation by overthrowing their plans. He loosens the fetters. He leads away the priest as spoil and men firmly seated. He overturns. He deprives of speech those who are trusted and takes away the discernment and discretion of the aged. He pours contempt on princes and loosens the belt of the strong, bringing low the pride of the learned. He uncovers deep things out of darkness and brings out to light black gloom and the shadow of death. Now listen to this. Oh, I hope America listens to this. He makes nations great and he destroys them. Let me read that again. This is our God. He makes nations great and he destroys them. He enlarges nations, but he also leads them away captive. He takes away understanding, now listen to this, from the leaders of the people. Who takes it away? God takes it away. He takes away understanding from the leaders of the people. That's why we pray for leaders of the land and of the earth and causes them to wander in a wilderness where there is no way. And they grope in the dark. Now, anyway, I read all that for this purpose because I, I underlined all the places where it says he, he, he. You know how many he's are in just that little bit of text? 24 at least. He, he, he. It's not about them. It's about, it's he. So how are we going to get this place fixed? America. I don't know if he's going to fix it or not, but I know he's doing something in the church that's unbelievable as a testimony on the earth that's going to blow the devil's socks off of him. But how does it happen? We got to get on our face and say, oh, God, it's you. Lord, I've sinned against you. Lord, the problem is not the government. The problem is me. Forgive me, God. Have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sin. And then we pray and intercede for our families, our children, cry out for him. And, and I wonder what God would do if we do that. Remember what Hezekiah, the nation was in a mess. Even Hezekiah was about to die. God says, Hezekiah, guess what? Get your house in order. You're about to be a dead man. Remember that? So what did Hezekiah do? He humbles himself. He and Isaiah together humble themselves, and God sends an angel. You saw an angel. He sends an angel, and the angel wipes out Sennacherib's forces. Sennacherib is a type of ISIS today in the same land where Sennacherib was ruling in Iraq. Same, it's a, the devil. It's incredible how he doesn't do anything new. He just changes clothes over generations. He's the same, he's the same, same tactics, same defeated foe, and our God reigns. But for our God to reign, we got to get low. So I'm going to ask you, would you join me for the next five minutes? Let's just spend time on our face. If you want to lay out, get on your knees. But if you would, I'm just going to ask you, let's join together with Christians all over America to humble ourselves and cry out to God, and then we'll, we'll give voice to that prayer together. But if you would like to join me. Father, we just bow, God, this day, and, and we humble ourselves together. Lord, we're on our face. We're on our knees before you. And, God, we confess against you have we sinned. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for idolatry. Forgive us 
for running after religion more than a relationship. Forgive us for running after what glitters rather than running after the cross. God, forgive us for being people of many words and yet less works that glorify your name. God, forgive us for wanting America to go back to its former greatness more than we want the church to rise up in your glory and represent the Son of God. Lord, we ask you for repentance to sweep across our nation. God, we can't fix the problems. They're unfixable. Lord, the enemy is not at the gate. He's in the gate, and he's right. His foot is on the throttle, Lord. And we ask you, God, like Hezekiah, like Isaiah, like believers all through the ages, God, we cry out to you, the living God, and we ask you, Lord, even as we sung that song, what the enemy is intended for so much evil, God, we ask you to turn it around, Lord. We ask you to rise up in this hour and scatter the enemies. God, rise up with a testimony of who you are in the earth that you rule and reign over the nations. You're the one that blesses nations, and you're the one that destroys nations. God, we know that you are the answer. You're the hope. You're the one, Lord, that even withholds understanding from the leaders. Forgive us, Lord, for not praying for our leaders as we ought. Forgive us for criticizing rather than interceding and going to the floor on their behalf, Lord. God, we ask for mercy. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, Lord for our differences, our divisions, our strife. God, forgive us of wanting things that wouldn't glorify you. Lord, all that Sammy spoke about, the things that Deborah spoke about, God, we cry out, search us and try us. Lord, we ask you as in the days of old that for a spirit of repentance to sweep across the churches of America. Lord, even though they're not even asking, we're interceding, Lord. We're crying out, God. We're asking you, Lord, send conviction, God, of sin and of unrighteousness. Lord, come and display your glory again in our nation, God. And, Lord, we give the future of our nation to you. We trust you completely, Lord, but our eyes are upon you. We look up to the hills from where our help comes from. Forgive us for looking to a government. We look to the God of the ages. You are a mighty fortress, is our God. And, Lord, we ask you for our sons. We ask you for our daughters, forgiving us for letting as Sammy reminded, the trinkets of this age to grab their attention more than calling them to, to love Jesus with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, God. Forgive us, Lord. We call our sons and daughters back. We call them, Lord, this generation to live for the living God. Lord, we're asking. Lord, we've been asking, and a bunch of people, we're finding out millions of believers are asking for another great awakening. And, Lord, we can't make it happen. We can't do it. As bad as we want it, it can't happen on our own terms. So, Lord, we lay down our terms. We lay down and we say, oh, God, touch America again. Raise up places, God, all over. Whether it's here, Lord, we, we care not. What we want is to see your glory. We want to see every state ablaze. We want to see the Baptists running back to the cross. We want to see the Methodists doing what their, that emblem says, of which their denomination is all about. We want to see the fire of God burn again, the fire that was upon the Wesleys. Lord, we want, to, we want the prayer of the Moravians answered, that the lamb would not lose the reward of his sacrifice. God, you sacrificed so much for this land. Lord, there have been laborers and laborers, prayer warriors, multitudes have died. Veterans of the army of God have died. And, Lord, we ask now that their prayers would not be in vain. Lord, the prayers of the Moravians, the prayers of all of those that labored, God, let this be the hour that God rises up in the land again. And so, Lord, we're just trusting you. Thank you for letting us be a part of this. God, we just... And, Lord, if those guys in Nevada don't have ears to hear, let, let Nevada lead the way, God. Pour out your spirit over the churches in Nevada, Father, in the name of Jesus. We intercede in North Carolina. God, let revival fire fall in that state, oh, God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we cry out to you. We cry out to you for our dads, our moms, 
And, Lord, we're a sick people. There's people dying of all kinds of diseases. Somehow, Lord, we just can't believe this is what you planned. So we cry out to the great physician. God, we don't need. We appreciate all the doctors, God, but obviously that's not where our hope is. You're tearing it down. So now, God, we ask that the king that heals everything would rise up now, God. That God care would be trumpeted across America. Lord, we thank you. We ask you. Yes, Lord, let Jesus stretch forth your hand to heal, that signs and wonders would be done through the holy name of your servant Jesus. And God, shake the houses of God, the prayer meetings, Lord, every denomination. God, we don't know what else to pray. We've been asking you. We've been banging the doors. And all we're doing now is laying on our face saying, God, we can't do it. We can't go another day. Our country is desperate. And we're crying out to you, God. We look to you, God. And so come and let it rain again. Let it rain on this nation. Let it rain on the earth, God. Let it rain in Iraq today, God. Let it rain in Iran, in Syria, in Jordan. God, let it rain in the Ukraine today. The rain of our God. Thank you, Lord. And so, Lord... Just let it, let, don't let it be a waste of time. God, let there be fruit immediate from this day. And God, we just so thank you. Thank you we can still run to our knees. We can still run to the throne room to find grace and help in time of need. And I thank you that when we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And now God, get us ready for the harvest all over this nation. Lord, stir it up now. The keys, Lord, release them to this harvest, we pray. Thank you for the billion youth that Darren reminded us of and all the others that will come in alongside of them. Here we are, God, afresh and anew. Nothing to offer but everything to give ourselves. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' strong name, and everyone said, Amen.